Our text tonight is Psalm 93, which was just read. Let me pray. Almighty and holy God, as a servant looks to his master and a handmaiden to her mistress, we lift our eyes unto you in our helplessness. We open wide our mouths that you might fill them, Lord. We come not to hear anyone but Christ, our prophet, priest, and king. Declare his will to us through the preaching of his word to his glory, in whose name we pray, amen. amen. <clears throat> well, a number of you young people here tonight, I know, have memorized the uh, Shorter Catechism. They have a very good uh, program here in our church. And you probably know the answer to the question, what offices doth Christ execute as our Redeemer? And Christ as our Redeemer executeth the offices of prophet, priest, and king, both in his estate of humiliation and exaltation. Now the answer to that question is one of the great archetonic themes that go straight through the scripture. And it's basically this question that has shaped the topics for the conference this week. We have had messages on Christ's humiliation, and we'll have another one tomorrow. We've had messages on Christ's exaltation, and we'll have another one of those uh, tomorrow. And then we have been looking at the offices of Christ. Prophet, we've considered. Priest, last night is the sacrifice, and again uh, tomorrow. But tonight, we want to think about Christ as king. Now, I would say that uh, the office of prophet it's kind of the bedrock of the three offices. It's that line that goes through Scripture that ties everything together because it's the basis of our knowing about Christ, not just as prophet, but as priest and king. And I would suggest that in his state of humiliation, the preeminent emphasis in the Scripture is on his office as the priest sacrifice. That's absolutely necessary if we were to have any approach unto God. But in his exaltation, well, the preeminent office is that of king. And it says king that he continues then to exercise his prophetic office and to apply the benefits of his priestly office. So as we were reminded yesterday, there are really three facets of the work of the Savior. But I believe that this office of king in his exaltation is now the preeminent way that our Savior is executing all of the various aspects or facets of his office. Now, in order to consider Christ as king, I want to use Psalm 93 as the lens, uh, the book that will open to us this work of our Savior. Psalm 93 begins a portion of the Psalms that concludes with Psalm 100, and I refer to them as Messianic Kingdom Psalms. Now, Dr. Barrett's done all the work. I can skip over all of that of why we are to look at these Psalms uh, and their references uh, as Messianic and their uh, clear patterns here in this section of Scripture. We just sang of Christ coming to, uh, coming to judge. We read the same thing in Psalm 96. He is coming to judge. There is an anticipation. So these psalms were written, I think, as typical psalms. Psalms written to address historical occasions in the life of the church, but come to their great fulfillment, not just in the advent, but in the royal reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, according to the Septuagint, Psalm 93 was written by King David, and I see no reason not to accept that, though it seems that most of the modern commentators don't accept that. And the Septuagint says that he wrote it when the land was settled. So it quite possibly could be that when David finally was crowned as king, made that way from his humiliation to his exaltation that he penned this psalm. We also know from at least tradition, that the psalm was used when the church returned from exile. 
perhaps used at the dedication of the new temple. Once again, God gave his people a broad place. But as such, it has then the primary focus out of those historical events on our Savior's entrance into his eternal glorious reign as king. Now what I want to do here is to show you that because Jesus Christ eternally rules over us and all things in majesty, power, and victory, we then are to serve him according to his word. Because Jesus Christ eternally rules over us and all things in majesty, power, and victory, we are to serve him in holiness according to his word. And I want to consider three things from this psalm with you. We have here in the first place the declaration that Jesus Christ is king. We then have the demonstration of the victory of King Jesus, and then a description of the response to the reign of King Jesus. So in the first stanza, verses 1 through 3, we have this declaration, uh, 1 and 2, the declaration that Christ is king. The Lord reigns. He's clothed with majesty. The Lord has clothed and girded himself with strength. Indeed, the world is firmly established. It will not be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. The opening statement, the Lord reigns. It should be an exclamation. It's not simply an an indicative. It's not simply a a summary statement that uh, Jehovah, Yahweh, who is Lord, is reigning. No, this is an assertion of glory. We could translate this that Jehovah has assumed kingship. He has begun to reign as a king. Now, we know that the triune Jehovah God is eternally ruling over all things. But this is a particular reference, as I've said, to the reign of Christ. But the language is very, uh, well, it's just picked up in Isaiah 52, where Isaiah, anticipating the return from captivity, will declare in Isaiah 52, uh, verse 7, how lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who announces peace, who brings the good news of happiness, who announces salvation and says to Zion, the church, your God reigns. Your God has assumed kingship. Announcing that as they return from captivity, there'll be an active ruling of God over them once again as he's symbolically there dwelling in the temple. But of course, as I've said, this is messianic. And Jehovah here, who is declared to assume kingship, is a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ in his state of exaltation. Now, the people expected the Messiah to reign in a glorious manner. It was announced in Psalm 2 when God uh, mocks his enemies. I would tell, I have set my king upon the holy hill of Zion. He was established there by God. In Psalm 110, David declares, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And of course, in Revelation, after the fact, in chapter 19, verse 16, the name that he wears on his robe is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so this declaration is that uh, Jesus of Nazareth, the incarnate Son of God, has assumed kingship. Now, as we think about Christ's kingship, we can actually say it occurred in three phases. The first will surprise you. He ruled as king in a pre-incarnate, not simply as the second person of the Godhead, but as the pre-incarnate king. Burkhoff wrote, the generally accepted position of the church is that Christ received his appointment as mediatorial king in the depths of eternity. 
and that he began to function as such immediately after the fall. He was the one who was going to come and destroy Satan, being bruised himself in the process. After he leads them across the Red Sea, and we know that it was the angel of the Lord who was in the pillar, the cloud, and the pillar of fire. And after the Red Sea, in that great song of Moses, it concludes with the fact that he is king, that our Savior was functioning a protective and delivering kingship over his people as he built his church. And thus, there were the typical kings through who he operated, judges and later kings. He was exercising his kingship through them. And who was it that Isaiah saw on a throne? pre-incarnate, high, and lifted up. It was our Savior, the angel of Jehovah, who was sitting enthroned over the people of God. And so there was a pre-incarnate phase to his kingship, just as there was to his work as priest and prophet. But the second phase is the exercise of his kingship in the state of humiliation. Now here... Kingship was kept under wraps. He knew that if he openly declared himself as king, there'd immediately be a push to make him a military conqueror of the Roman Empire. Yes, they expected a mighty messianic king, but they thought of one who would bear a, a, a human sword and, and destroy their enemies. And so he, he kept it low, much like the king, again, we've already heard once today about uh, uh, Tolkien, the king who was but a ranger until he finally entered into his uh, coronation. And so, in the state of humiliation, Christ was a king. In fact, you remember, he was anointed as king, right? At his baptism with water, anointing as a prophet, priest, and king, and by the Holy Spirit, whom he received without measure. And at times, of course, it would break through. He stills the storm. He raises the dead. Spiritually, it breaks through. The Son of Man has authority to forgive sin. He answered the call of blind Bartimaeus, son of David, have mercy on me. And of course, he entered Jerusalem as the king, the messianic king. King, that he might go to the cross. Have you ever noticed the juxtaposition in Revelation 5 when John is weeping because no one is found worthy to uh, execute the decrees of God in the scroll and he's told by one of the elders, behold, the king of the tribe of Judah, uh, the lion of the tribe of Judah, reference to the Davidic king. And when he turns, what does John see? A lamb. You see, he had to be the suffering lamb, the sacrificial lamb, in order to be mounted up as king. But he was king in that pre incarnate state. Now we can compare the relationship of his phase two and phase three kingship to David himself. You remember there was a long stretch of time between David's anointing as king and when he was first crowned then by uh, the tribe of Judah and seven years later by all the tribes of Israel. Uh, he was in that period of humiliation and waiting, and Christ went through that period for three years. He was king, but it was not the predominant manifestation of his ministry. No, that took place, as we've already heard today, in his resurrection and ascension and his session at the right hand of God the Father. Again, Burkhoff, he did not publicly and formally assume his throne and inaugurate his spiritual kingdom until the time of his ascension and elevation at the right hand of God. Now, when the Westminster Larger Catechism describes Christ as king, it uses this, or excuse me, Christ in his sitting at the right hand of God, it describes him as king. Christ is exalted in his sitting at the right hand of God, in that as God-man, he advanced to the highest favor with God the Father, 
with all fullness of joy, glory, and power <coughs> over all things in heaven and earth, and doth gather and defend his church, and subdue their enemies, furnish his ministers and peoples with gift and graces, and makes intercession for them. You'll see later this language is very similar to the very description of Christ's exercise of the office as exalted king. And so we are told here that our Savior, in his resurrection, ascension, and session, now is crowned as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now what does this reign look like? As he's declared to have assumed reign, to be king, the Holy Spirit gives us four descriptive characteristics of his reign. <coughs> in the first place, as we already heard this afternoon from Psalm 45, he was clothed with majesty. Earthly kings clothe themselves in garments that to demonstrate their dignity, their preeminence, their majesty. They'll have these glorious robes with gold threads and crowns encrusted with all kinds of, of precious jewels and gems. Those who are around them will be clothed in, in beautiful garments. They will sit on uh, uh, elaborate and ornate thorn, thrones lifted up. And all of this was to declare to all who came into their presence, this one is king. This one is monarch. This one is clothed in majesty and in splendor. But here we're told, that our king is clothed in majesty, clothed in majesty and splendor, such a splendor that uh, the metaphors can fiercely, uh, uh, barely uh, 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 describe it. Think, for example, of that vision in, in Isaiah 6, that I saw the Lord, Adonai, high and lifted up, and his robe filled the temple that was also filled with the very smoke of the presence of God, or of the unimaginable description in Revelation of the majesty of our Savior. So John says, I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet, girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head, his hair were white like wool, like snow. And his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it's been made to glow in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. You see one figure <coughs> heaped upon another to try to help us imagine the unimaginable, the absolute beauty and splendor uh, and majesty of our king who now is enthroned as our king, our mediatorial king, our prophet and our priest. Now, given these figures, we can go a bit further and see that how Christ does manifest his beauty and eminence. He does so in his works. And so we're told that our king is the creator and that our king is the sustainer and our king is the governor. And we'll come to more of that in, in just a few moments. Um, we're told that our king rules over all the nations. And then we're given his attributes. And for example, as we look this morning in Psalm 45, we see a number of these attributes which are but the, the splendid beauty of the glory of God. And here as the king, our groom, is described in verse 2, you are fairer than the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Six, your throne, O God, is forever and ever a scepter of uprightness. We see the attribute. You've loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, your God, God, your God has anointed you with oil of joy above your fellows. It's in his work. It's in his attributes that this unimaginable glory 
of our glorious King begins to, to break through and to shine. Now we're driving down the interstate, we're going to pull across here at a little roadside park. A digression. And actually, I didn't fully answer the question this afternoon because <laughs> I wanted to save this for right now. If you think about the majesty and beauty of Christ, it will stimulate you in your worship. And these descriptions are designed to do that. A few years ago, my wife and I went to Hampton Court. And as we were doing the tour, it was explained to us that each chamber would give way to one that was more splendid. The next, even more splendid. And the livery, the dress of the attendants, more glorious. Until finally you are prepared. You're, you're so awed that when you come into the presence of the king on the throne, you have been filled with wonder and awe and reverence. And now that's what the meditation on the majesty of Christ should do for you and me as we enter his courts in worship. We start in the outer chamber. We start in this glorious world that he has made and governed, and we revel in the beauty of his creation and, and the wonder of these laws that are really the habits of God. And we, uh, we begin to sense the beauty and glory of the Savior. And then we begin to, um, to go through uh, the chambers, the intricacies of uh, providence, the glorious revelation, and each room is more beautiful. And then we begin to hear voices singing. Think about those hymns that we sing where we're extolling the angels to join in in the, in the praise of our king. And then we see the, the angels and the souls of just men made perfect. And now we come before the one who is high and exalted on the throne. And our hearts indeed, as Dr. Barrett said, should be hot with passion. We should be thrilled with joy. And this is where we are on the Lord's day, my friends. In a mystery, because of this union with Christ in the heavenlies, we levitate. We enter into this ethereal sphere. And we can be prepared for that and stimulated as we will meditate that Jehovah reigns and is clothed with majesty. Think often. Meditate on the beautiful splendor of the person and work of your Savior. Second, we're told that he is a powerful king. Two words put together. The Lord has clothed and girded himself with strength. Now, most of the kings and queens of which you and I are familiar would be constitutional monarchs or parliamentarian monarchs. And Mr. Kingswood has a queen. And uh, she has a lot of eminence and majesty, a lot of wealth, but she can't control an army. She has no power among the nations. Not our king. Our king is not a paper tiger. Our king is not <coughs> at the mercy <coughs> of the realm of a parliament. No, our king has clothed and girded himself with power. That power, strength, it is the power of a sword. Again, as we read this, this afternoon in Psalm 45, gird your sword on your thigh, O mighty one, in your splendor and your majesty, and in your majesty ride on victoriously for the cause of truth and meekness and righteousness. And let your right hand teach you awesome things. Your arrows are sharp. The peoples fall under you. Your arrows are in the heart of the king's enemy. What does the father say to him in Psalm 2? Ask of me, and I will give the nations as your inheritance, and the uttermost ends of the earth as your possession. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And then that majestic description in Revelation 19. I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. <coughs> his eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. He has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. 
He's clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses, and from his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty, and on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. This, dear friends, <coughs> is your king, your king who has clothed and girded himself with power, your king who, because he's victorious, has put on this mighty sword, the exercise of his own word, and he goes forth conquering and to conquer, slaying those who resist and subduing those whom he calls unto himself. He is powerful king. He is your king. We'll come back to that power. The next thing that we see in Psalm 93, we've seen that he's majestic and he's powerful, but we see also that his reign is universal. Indeed, the world is firmly established. It will not be moved. What does this have to do with the kingship of Christ? It's because into his hands, according to Hebrews 1.3. The triune God has entrusted the entire rule of the entire universe. This theme is picked up in, in these Messianic Kingdom Psalms. Psalm 95, for the Lord is a great God, a great King above all gods, in whose hands are the depths of the earth, the peaks of the mountains are his also, the sea is his, for he made it. And his hands formed the dry land. There's a lot of talk today that Christ is the mediator king only over his church. Is that what we read here, friends? Do we not read here that he is the one who establishes and holds together the earth? He rules over all things. He rules in over all of nature. He rules over every earthquake, every blizzard sweeping through the northeast. Every tsunami, every volcano, every illness, every cancer cell, every drunk driver who destroys a family. He rules over the nations of the earth. No king, no premier, no president, no prime minister can ever enter into power outside of the active work of our king. And he deposes those whom he will depose. He lifts up those whom he will lift up. His reign is universal. And as we heard today, it is a universal reign for the sake of the church. And so as Paul concludes that glorious section in Ephesians chapter 1 and speaks of the reign of our Savior, he says in verse 21 that he's been exalted far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things physically, geopolitically, spiritually, the kingdoms of hell and Satan as well as his church, all things under his feet and gave him head over all things to the church which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. You open the newspaper or you look online in the morning and you see what happened in the world today. If it's real news, then what you're seeing is what King Jesus did today. Not just what King Jesus did today, what he did today for you, for his church, for moving forward his great kingdom program until the earth is covered with the knowledge of God like the seas cover the globe. His reign is universal. And then the fourth characteristic of the reign of our Savior is that it is eternal. Your throne is established from of old and you are from everlasting. This is not simply talking now about the second person of the God. We're talking about the Messianic King. The throne was established when? Remember where we started? 
in the depths of eternity. He was appointed the mediatorial king. And he shall reign as king forever. There's actually a phase four to this reign of Christ. I do not understand 1 Corinthians 15 to mean that he'll cease being king at the end of the age. He'll cease being king in a certain manner over his church. But we could not last one moment apart from the sustaining power and grace of our king. And we see in Revelation that he's the lamb who is on the throne. He is an eternal king. There'll be no end to his reign throughout this age and in the age to come. And that means, dear friends, that he is unchangeable. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The king you read about in the Old Testament on behalf of his people. The king who stalked this earth and even in his humiliation did so many kingly things. The king of whom you read here is exalted on high. The king who has converted one person after another and one nation after another. This king is your king. This king reigns forever. This king is unchangeable. His love for you is unchangeable. His love for his church is unchangeable. His program is unchangeable. Regardless what men think or how they respond. And so we have this declaration that our Savior is, in fact, a reigning king. He's not a king in waiting. He's not like the Prince of Wales waiting for his ancient mother to die. There'll be three princes of Wales before she ever dies. <laughs> he is king. He's been king. He's now king. He's your king. He is on the throne. Matthew Henry wrote that the next to the deity and power of God, his active rule is the most important thing for a Christian to know. Are you aware of that tonight? That the active rule of Christ is the most important thing for you, Christian, to know, to understand, to grasp, and to live by. You see, it is as this king this reigning, majestic, powerful king, that he did subdue you to himself. With that word that went out of his mouth, he did not destroy you, he did not pass you by, but he exercised his kingly power to apply to you his redemption. With those strong cords of love to draw you effectually unto himself. He is your king. He has subdued you. But he's also defending you. He is all powerful. And he has absolute omnipotence. And thus he shall protect and keep you. That brings us to the second thing. Having seen the declaration of his reign, we look now at the demonstration of the victory of our king. <clears throat> the next two verses. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their pounding waves more than the sound of many waters, than the mighty breakers of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. Some scoff. You say that your Savior is king. But look at this world. It's a mess. Look at the opposition. Look at the people who are killing his subjects and destroying his church. Look at his church. She's more like a bag lady than the bride of Christ. And the scriptures are quite realistic. We indeed are surrounded by enemies. And so Psalm 2 begins the declaration of the wicked through their rulers. That they'll cast off the cords of God and his Messiah. They'll break it off. They will not submit. Now that's what's being expressed here in the tumult of water. The floods have lifted up, O Lord, the floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their pounding waves more than the sounds of many water, than the mighty breakers of the sea. You see, in the Bible, the water in its roaring and tumbling is used for the opposition of the world and Satan 
and his kingdoms to the kingdom of Christ. Isaiah chapter 17, verses 12 and 13. Alas, the uproar of many peoples who roar like the roaring of the seas and the rumbling of nations, who rush on like the rumbling of mighty waters. The nations rumble on like the rumbling of many waters. But he will rebuke them and they will flee away. Yeah, there are floods. That's what it means in Revelation that there's no sea in heaven. Doesn't mean it's going to be waterless. There'll be no opposition. Nothing shall stand against the Messiah in his day of final consummation. But now there are these floods. There are these awful enemies of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Nations and kings and despots and tyrants who've set themselves against Christ. Who say, you cannot bring your gospel into our country. Who will behead Christians. The weakness of the church. The failures of the West. The great decline that we have witnessed in our own short lifespan. We are bombarded by Satan and the world. Yes, even our own flesh. But notice the demonstration of victory. More than the sounds of many waters, the Lord on high, our King, is mighty. The Savior who stilled the storm, who divided the Red Sea, who walked on water. This is the king that rules over all of the unruly nations and all the floods. Floods are powerful. We've seen on television a truck swept off a bridge by two inches of water, a house being carried down a river, tsunamis destroying entire villages. Enthroned in calmness over all this chaos of the world expressed by torrential floods and pounding waves is our king calmly set on his throne who is mighty, mightier than the breakers of the sea. Perhaps you've heard the story of the great Christian king Canute, I don't know if it's a true story or not, but it's a good story. <laughs> he, was, he was a very godly king. He was surrounded by, as most kings are, with a lot of flatterers and courtiers that were constantly praising him and that he could do anything. And he got tired of it. So he had them carry his throne down to the edge of the sea. Do you believe I can control the water? Oh, yes, king, of course you can control the water. Sits his throne down. And he says, water, you may come no farther. You may not wet my feet or my robe. Now his courtiers thought he'd gone crazy. And they look aghast. He says it again. You know what's happening? The water is just coming closer and closer and closer until at the last moment he jumps up. And he turns back and he says, then to those who are there um, with him, we find his quotation. You probably can't find his quotation. Basically, what he tells the sea to do is to stop, and when the sea uh, refuses uh, to stop, uh, he then jumps up, runs back, takes off his crown, never wears it again. He says, "Only." The Lord God controls the sea. But the Lord God does control the sea. Our mediatorial king controls not just the sea, but all the tumults that are against us. So yes, today, there are nations who say to Christ, you may not come here. No, well, Mayo Sitong said that, didn't he? Now there are millions, if not billions, of Christians in mainland China. That government will collapse not under the failures of an economic system. It will one day collapse under the very erosion of the gospel church. Islam says you may not come here, but all God's doing is converting untold numbers of Muslims. 
We heard at Prime Meeting a few weeks ago that there are 100,000 Christians now in Iran, and that's within about five years. So yes, the nations will say no, and they will persecute Christians, which only causes the church to grow. But as I said earlier, they cannot do that apart from the permission of King Jesus. He has his holy purposes. That's exactly what he's doing. Now, dear friends, the same is true of individuals. And some of you sitting here tonight have said no to King Jesus. You've said, we will not have this man rule. I will not have this man rule over me. And you know he's going to rule over you. If he does not rule over you by grace, he then is going to rule over you with a rod of iron. He's going to shatter you to pieces like a, a flower pot under a rod. He's going to break you. He's going to drive you to his feet to pay homage as he says to you, depart from me. I never knew you. It's futile. You flaunt about now and you think you're so much in control and you're enjoying your life of sin. Can you not see it's futile? The floods cannot resist him. The floods of your puny heart cannot resist him. Either submit to him in the way that he's appointed by paying homage, kiss the son, repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ who has offered himself as the sacrifice for sinners and fully receives any who flee unto him. But trust me, you resist his gracious rule and he's going to destroy you forever in hell. And now is the time of salvation. It's one of the themes in these Psalms, a passage of scripture with which many of you will be familiar. Uh, says, um, today, if you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as in the days of Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me. They tried me, though they seen my work. For 40 years, I loathed. That's a very harsh word, isn't it? I loathed. I hated that generation and said they are a people who err in their heart and they do not know my ways. Therefore, I swore in my anger, truly, they shall not enter into my rest. And that is the oath of the king tonight. If you die in rebellion, his oath is, you shall not enter into his rest, but you should be cast into hell. But you know, we, yes, we have the enemy of the world and the enemy of Satan, but as was said earlier today, we also have an enemy in our own hearts. As old Pogo said, I've seen the enemy and it's us. And we wear in these frail bodies a remnant of sin. And that's discouraging, isn't it? You've got your own floods, the things that are tormenting you and uh, that fill you full of fear. But do you not see that your king is absolutely sufficient to deliver you, to sustain you? Some of you are wrestling with pornography. Some with drunkenness. Some of you young people are wrestling with pornography. And you have repented so many times. And you've taken so many oaths. And you've had no deliverance. But if you're in Christ, then he is a conquering king. You seek him. You seek him for kingly power. To apply to you the power of the resurrection and to deliver you from the powers of sin. So we've seen in the first point that our king subdues us, and here we see in this demonstration of victory that he restrains and conquers all of his and our enemies. But as we think about our own enemies and our own struggles with sin and our pursuit of sanctification, that brings us to the last thing, and that is the description of the response of the subjects to the king. 
The last verse, your testimonies are fully confirmed. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. Your testimonies are fully confirmed. Kings and monarchs have their charters and uh, their law books. And our king has a law book. It's called here a testimony. A testimony is one of the 10 or 11 synonyms in Psalm 119, for example, that describes the Bible. But each one has its own nuance. And this one is very important as we think about the king. Because this word testimony is tied to the word witness. And so we read in Deuteronomy chapter 31 that the witness of the covenant was placed inside the ark. And what was the ark called? The ark of the testimony. The testimony is God's covenant law for his people. The testimony declares the great covenant promise that I am your God and you are my people and all that he has done for us and will do for us. And the testimony declares then to us how we as subjects of the king are to respond to him. It's the charter of our king. And we read here it's sure. That's repeated in Psalm 19. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimonies of the Lord are sure making wise the simple. There's no error in them. God's word is true and perfect because he is true and perfect and he has entrusted to us then this covenant testimony. He said, I'm your king and here's how I'm going to rule you. I will rule you uh, through this word. And so again, when we, uh, we think about the combination of uh, the three offices now exercised from heaven. It's the king who rules us through his word and gives us his holy law. It's the king who in the covenant testimony keeps before us the Lamb of God, slain before the foundations of the earth in whom alone is our only hope. And the king does this particularly, dear friends, in his church. And so as we read of the exercise of our king, we're told that as he does uh, subdue his enemies, Christ executes the office of a king and calling out of the world a people to himself, giving them officers, laws, and censures by which he visibly governs them. That's the testimonies of the Lord that are sure. The king's word. Do you cherish it tonight? as the king's charter. We know how in our own country, particularly in the last five to 10 years, there's been a, a great upswing of interest in the constitution of our country. That's been good. More and more people are familiar with the constitution, read and study the constitution. That's important. It's necessary for a, a free republic to survive. Do you have the same attitude about the charter of your king? Do you delight in the testimonies of the Lord? Would you die rather than give up your copy of the testimonies of the Lord? And are you willing to be governed by him through his word? Whether you really like the commandment or not that you happen to, he happens to speak to you at some point. Are you daily in the word? reading the testament of the king that you might commune with our glorious Savior in the way that he has appointed? Are you men leading your families or your wives in daily reading and prayer that you all might grow together under the blessing and guidance of the king? And do you relish the preaching of the word of God, that unique event in which the king supernaturally speaks to us as our prophet priest and we hear his voice in the preaching of the word of God. You love this word. Do you know it? You memorize it, meditating on it, being governed by the king in his word. It's never too young for the children to learn the habits of Bible reading. And you make sure that your little ones, as they can learn to read, they're reading the Bible. 
And as you get older, you young people develop the habit of Bible reading. It's a godly habit. There's nothing wrong with godly habits. They're good. You might want to not do it some days. I don't like to brush my teeth in the morning sometimes, but uh, it's a habit and I know I have to do it. So cultivate in them and encourage them to cultivate for themselves the faithful use of Scripture. So we see that our, our Savior now is ruling us by His Word. But the last thing that is said here about the response is that holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. Our King is absolutely holy. In Him there is no sin, no stain, no more. His house then, His throne room, His habitation is of perfect holiness. And what we're being reminded of here is if we are going to dwell with a holy king, it's not simply through our justification that we will dwell with him, but no, it must be in a growth in holiness. So in Psalm 96, we hear the command, worship the Lord in holy attire, robed in a righteousness, a holiness in which you are seeking by the king's grace to grow daily, dying to sin and growing in increased conformity to his will. Uh, one of these great kingly psalms, 99, celebrates the holiness of our king. It's repeated three times over, and he loves justice. He's executed justice and righteousness, and we are to exalt him, exalt our God, and worship at his holy hill, for holy is the Lord our God. Now, is there anything less that you should give to your holy king than holiness? And if you would dwell in his house, would you not be holy? And so we are to glorify God and to enjoy him. We recognize who our king is, his majesty, his glory, his splendor, all that he does for us in defending us and keeping us. We should want to please him according to his covenant word and obey him. And the climax. Isn't it the climax? Corporate worship. That's the theme that goes through here of the response that we owe to the king. And that's why Psalm 100 is such a fitting conclusion. It doesn't mention him as king. That's been mentioned throughout the little section. But now... Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with thanks, joyful singing. Know that the Lord, Jehovah himself, is God. It's he who's made us, not we ourselves. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates. Now, we do that in corporate worship. As I said, we enter into heaven itself because of union with Christ. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting and his faithfulness to all generations. And so the king holds court. Now we serve him in his lands every day in our callings, all of which, if they're lawful, are very important to the king. But once a week, throughout the day, the king holds court. And we're to gather formally with his people morning and evening. And we're then to meditate on his beauties and glories and his great rain in the remainder of the day. Some actually suggest that Psalm 92 is a part of this little vignette. I think not, but there, there is the connection of verses 8 and 9. But you, O Lord, are on high forever, for behold, your enemies, O Lord, your enemies will perish. All who do iniquity will be scattered. But the church put these two together. So Psalm 92 is called uh, a psalm for the Sabbath. The Septuagint made Psalm 93 the psalm that was read the day before the Sabbath. And so as we prepare for the Lord's Day, we meditate on Saturday that the Lord is King, clothed in majesty, clothed and girded with power, with a universal and 
eternal rule in which he governs his enemies. He restrains and conquers them. He protects us as he governs us through his word. And so we come into the very special presence of the king. Isn't it great? Jehovah Christ reigns. He has assumed an almighty exalted kingship over all things and particularly his church and for the sake of his church. He reigns in majesty and in power and over all things forever. And he's victorious over all of his and our enemies. And it's our privilege to serve him according to his word. This will give great backbone to your pursuit of holiness. It will be a great staff in the way of the pilgrimage as you and I press on to that celestial city. But there's a particular response that the psalmist gives us in Psalm 96, coupled with worship. He says, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Proclaim good tidings. It's the Hebrew for gospel of his salvation from day to day. Tell of his glory among the nations, his wonderful deeds among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He's to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. It is our privilege, dear friends, to go forth as we serve the king and proclaim his name to our neighbors, to our towns, to the ends of the earth that Jehovah reigns. He is a glorious and wonderful king and there's no king like him and none worthy of the service of which he is worthy. And we do so then with great confidence. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in holy attire. Tremble before him. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Indeed, the world is firmly established. It will not be moved. He will judge the people with equity. And so those are our orders servants of the king. We are always to be outward looking. We are to be jealous for his crown rights unto the end of the earth. And we give ourselves to that. And so we give ourselves to pray for that. And a very interesting parallel between what we read about Christ and his kingly office and what we pray for in the second petition. In the second petition, which is thy kingdom come, acknowledging ourselves and all mankind to be by nature under the dominion of sin and Satan, we pray that the kingdom of sin and Satan may be destroyed, the gospel propagated throughout the world, the Jews call, the fullness of the Gentiles brought in, the church furnished with all gospel officers and ordinances, purged from corruption, countenanced and maintained by the civil magistrates, that the ordinances of Christ may be purely dispensed and made effectual to the converting of those that are yet in their sins, the confirming and comforting building up of those that are already converted, that Christ would rule in our hearts here and hasten the time of his second coming and our reigning with him forever. That he would be pleased so to exercise the kingdom of his power in all the world as may best conduce to those ends. It's that we should pray for every day. It's that which we labor for every day. As we were reminded yesterday, because we are in the second Adam, that we are heirs of the earth and the dominion mandate belongs to us and it begins with a gospel mandate. The earth belongs to whom? To Christ. And thus it belongs to Christ's church. And so let us go forth in the boldness of the reign of the king and plant his flag in every place that we can, that he might have all glory and honor, yes, in the age to come, but he's not worth much more today than that which he's being given. Is that not your passion? 
be jealous for the honor of the king. Labor in your own vocations, in gospel witness, in prayers, and above all in supporting the work of the church that his kingdom will come. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for this wonderful declaration about your Son, our Savior, our King, who reigns on high. May we be comforted and encouraged, strengthened as we think of these things. O oh, King Jesus, ride this day, we plead with you. Mount on that white stallion, rampage the nations, conquering and conquering Lord. Subdue your people and restrain and conquer our enemies. Convert and perfect your saints and rule over us and defend us. Oh, Lord, grant that we would see your glory today in the reformation and revival of the church and the conquest of the nations of the earth. For Christ's sake, for the glory of our King, we pray. Amen.